For much of the 20th century, the rivalry between the Soviet Union and the United States in political, military, and economic strength had gained a special strategic importance. While the central command economy of the Soviet Union was diametrically opposed to the free market liberalism of Western nations, the rapid economic development that the Soviets posted in the middle decades of the century made their system appear to be a viable economic alternative. Once the growth slowed down, various reforms were instituted to revive the stagnating economy. Gradually, the Soviet Union eventually collapsed, along with its promise of an alternative to Western capitalism. The centralized economic planning, during mid-20th century, helped largely in the growth of the Soviet economy, but its reforms to decentralize economic power ultimately led to its erosion. In this video, let us deeply analyze the economic and military factors that led to the failure of this once upon a time giant superpower. The year 1917 saw the last Russian Tsar, which is a Russian word for emperor, being overthrown by a group of revolutionaries, who fought and won a subsequent civil war to create a socialist state within the borders of the former Russian Empire. Five years later, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or USSR, as we popularly know it, was established, bringing together a confederation of states under the rule of the Communist Party. Starting in 1924, with Joseph Stalin's rise to power, a command economy characterized by totalitarian control over political, social, and economic life would define the Soviet Union for most of the remaining 20th century. In order to achieve the economic goals of the Federation, Communist Party officials assumed control over all of the country's social and economic activities. They justified this control by claiming that the party had complete knowledge of how to direct a society that would rival and overtake any Western market economy. All economic decisions including production, consumption, wages, interests, rent, etc., were taken by government officials. Contrary to what you'd expect, the Soviet Union experienced rapid economic growth in its initial years. Yes, they posted an estimated average annual growth rate in gross national product GNP, of 5.8%, from 1928 to 1940, 5.7% 5 from 1950 to 1960, and 5.2% from 1960 to 1970. This consistent growth over a period of 42 years was truly a remarkable achievement. The impressive performance was largely due to the fact that, as an underdeveloped economy, the Soviet Union only had a way up ahead, but that is not all. There were many problems associated with the extreme nature of the socialist economy of the USSR. One very general problem was the lack of incentives for productivity. An anonymous Soviet citizen once said, they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. A Russian economist, Grigory Yalvlinsky, who ultimately became an important advisor to Mikhail Gorbachev, was convinced about the need for reforms when he investigated the low productivity in the Soviet mines. In his study, he found that the miners were not working, simply because they had no incentives to work. Not just this, there were more immediate causes for the collapse. In the middle 1980s, about 70% of the industrial output of the Soviet Union was going to the military. Oleg Gordievsky, a secret agency official of the USSR, who defected to Britain, asserted that at least one-third of the total industrial output was going to the military. Initially, British intelligence could not even believe the fact that, such a high proportion of the output was being diverted to the military. You will be surprised to learn that later, Western intelligence sources estimated that the output being diverted was not 30, but at least 50 percent. Now, one can only imagine what severe shortages of industrial goods there were, for the rest of the economy. The Soviet leaders have always concentrated on strengthening their military power. In fact, by the 1970s, the Soviet Union had even achieved parity with the United States in military power. They managed to do this even though their military budget was nearly half, or one-third of the US, but achieving parity with the US was not an end to the arms buildup. 
Soviet leaders suggested that the Federation should further strive for parity with the combined forces of the NATO and China. Now, since the 1950s, the Soviets had been aware of the long-term problems of the socialist system. As the size and affairs of the economy grew, so did its complexity and the need for decentralization. Subsequently, reforms were initiated to decentralize economic control, allowing for a second economy to deal with the increasing complexity of affairs and stagnation of economic growth. These reforms, however, tore the root of the socialist institutions, and Khrushchev was forced to re-reform back to centralized control and coordination in the early 1960s. But with economic growth declining and inefficiencies becoming increasingly more apparent, partial reforms to allow for more decentralized market interactions were reintroduced in the early 1970s. The Soviet leaders wanted to create a more liberal market system in a society whose core foundations were characterized by centralized control. These early reforms failed to revive the increasingly stagnant Soviet economy, with productivity growth falling below zero by the early 1980s. This ongoing poor economic performance led to a more radical set of reforms under the leadership of Mikhail Gorbachev. While attempting to maintain socialist ideals and central control over primary societal goals, Gorbachev aimed to decentralize economic activity and open the economy up to foreign trade. This restructuring, referred to as perestroika, encouraged individual private incentive, creating greater openness. Perestroika was in direct opposition to the previously hierarchical nature of the socialist economy. But having greater access to information helped the Federation not just in economic terms, but also of social life. When the Soviet leadership relaxed control, in order to save the faltering economic system, they helped create conditions that would lead to the country's dissolution. As Soviet firms took advantage of new freedoms and new investment opportunities, perestroika initially appeared to be a success, but the optimism soon faded. A severe economic contraction characterized the late 1980s and early 1990s, which would be the last years of the Soviet Union. Just a little prior to this, Ronald Reagan was elected as the U.S. president in 1980, and he increased the military budget of the U.S. Furthermore, he even presented the possibility that the government could implement a Star Wars anti-ballistic missile system. Now, we are all aware about the armament race that existed between the U.S. and the USSR during that time. So in order to maintain a parity with the U.S., the USSR was required to divert an even larger share of industrial output to the military. The planners and decision makers had to face the fact that it was economically impossible for the Soviet Union to increase the share of its output going to the military. The Soviet authorities then ended the arms race and called off the Cold War. Interestingly, the Soviet rule was based on this very perceived threat posed to its sovereignty by the external forces. So when the justification of an external threat was removed due to an end in the armament race, there was no reason for the Russian public to tolerate the totalitarian regime and thus, the political system and the economy fell apart. That was all about the failure of Soviet economy. Do like, share, comment and subscribe to our channel, Explified.